today I'm talking to you about getting the most out of uh, nitri nitrogen in regards to wheat, but I was also supposed to talk a little about, bit about some of the other uh, macronutrients as well. So if you'll indulge me, I'll go back in time here, a little bit of history. So uh, a long time ago, I used to work in the peace country and uh, it was a great place to learn because the soils were really crappy up there, you know, because they were developed under a gray wooded forest soil up there. And so there's all kinds of problems you could see. And this is a, a field that I came across at one point that's um, uh, it's phosphorus deficient. And the dark green areas that you see in the field out there is where you had manure down in the past. And um, at the time he was told to use some rock phosphate, which of course, you know, comes available in a hundred years or so, you know, so he wasn't really putting any phosphorus down and ended up with these phosphorus deficiency symptoms. And you can see the symptoms are developing on the old leaves here first, and it's kind of, they can be a purple color and they can be sort of this translucent yellow color as well. And unfortunately, when you see this, you can't do much really to rescue the crop from a phosphorus deficiency. Unlike a forage crop that has a lot of surface feeding roots, you can broadcast phosphorus on the surface and, and the, that phosphorus will go into making forage for you. But uh, in the case of cereals, this sort of thing, a broadcast application almost needs to be four times as much as you would put underground to be of any use. So we couldn't really rescue this crop and the bad areas look like this where we have uh, little yield and also the maturity has gone long. So it's greener because phosphorus is needed for energy within the plant and, and helps the plant mature. Um, there are some interesting things about phosphorus. This is an oldie and a goodie slide. It was done way back in uh, 1986 and I think Les Henry was part of this uh, little demonstration. And uh, what they did was they put down broadcasted applications of phosphorus in the soil and, and incorporated them. So they had, you know, zero being the check and then 82 and 163 pounds of broadcasted phosphorus in the soil. And this gave us different soil with different levels of uh, background phosphorus. And so you have five parts per million, eight parts per million and 15 parts per million. And you can see here that we've got you know, a nice response curve here when we've got low levels of phosphorus. This is uh, side banded or with seed place phosphorus. And as we increase seed place phosphorus, we we're increasing yield. And then as we went to soils that have higher levels of phosphorus, we have responses, but they're not as responsive. But you'll note here that when we've got lots of phosphorus in the ground, you just can't make up for having low levels of phosphorus in your soil. You can't put a whole bunch down and make up for not maintaining high levels of phosphorus. And to me, this makes intuitive sense because you only, the plant only finds about 20% of the phosphorus that you put down as fertilizer in that year. Now, the, the use efficiency over the long term is quite high. It will find every piece of phosphorus that you put in the soil eventually, but of the fertilizer that you put down in season, it's only finding 20% and the rest of the 80% is coming from the roots exploring the whole volume of soil in there. So if your whole volume of soil is lacking in phosphorus, you just can't make up for that, for that uh, deficiency. So it's a, it's a nice little demonstration of the importance of keeping your phosphorus levels up. It can be hard to keep your phosphorus levels up if especially when we've got um, you know, issues with seed safety and this sort of thing. But when you've got the opportunity in cereals, for example, to put down higher rates of phosphorus, and if your levels are say below 11 parts per million, then it might be worth taking steps to try and increase your background levels of phosphorus when, when it's cheaper. And of course, you've probably, you may have seen this slide, I've seen it in many, many presentations. And it, again, this is taken from the peace country, uh, not by me, but uh, it's showing the effect of phosphorus in terms of pop-up effect. You often hear about that term. And the whole field was fall banded with 70N30 phosphorus and some potassium sulfur. And, and then in spring, this, just this part here had an extra 10 pounds of seed place phosphorus. And you can see how the plants have really popped up here and have uh, grown much better from having that phosphorus close by. 
But the thing that you have to remember in this, this picture is that, you know, this is up in the peace country, things are cold, you know, when this, when this occurred. And if you have cold, wet conditions, um, you can benefit by having that phosphorus closer to the seed because the seed has to germinate and it has to grow and it has to find that phosphorus. It has to go and find it. But for many of us, you know, side banding is close enough. You know, if you're putting the phosphorus down in a side band, we have warm soils when we're seeding, you know, it's going to find it, it's close enough and you, and you, won't, you won't see much of a, a deficit from not having it directly seed placed. Um, if you want to sort of cut your risks and you have the opportunity to do so, you could place a third of your phosphorus with the seed and then two thirds with the, uh, with the side band. And that gives you the best of both worlds because if you have it all with the seed and you have dry conditions and the soil dries out from the top down really quickly, you can actually strand that phosphorus at the surface. Um, and so you're just cutting your risks. But like I said, side banding is, is fine for us. So this, this is another nutrient deficiency, again, from the peace country from long ago. And uh, in this case, it's not phosphorus, it's sulfur. So the sul this field is so sulfur deficient that it's showing up badly in wheat even here. And if you were to plant canola in this field at this level, you'd get almost next to no um, yield as a result of that. And unlike nitrogen deficiency, nitrogen deficiency is on the right here. It's the old leaves that turn yellow and that's because nitrogen is mobile in the plant. The plant can take the nitrogen out of the old leaves and put it, it takes it out of the old leaves and puts it into the new leaves as it's growing. But sulfur isn't mobile in the plant. So you'll note here that the, the yellowing is occurring with the new growth. It can't sacrifice the old leaves and put the sulfur into the new leaves in there. So that's why the symptoms show up there. But unlike um, phosphorus deficiency, you can put uh, applications of sulfur down later and rescue that crop. And that's what we did in this particular field. I'm standing in the spot here where we didn't put any ammonium sulfate broadcasted down and the rest of the field had ammonium sulfate broadcasted and it really picked up the crop. And you may say, well, okay, well, we don't have, you know, really brutally sulfur deficient situations like that here, but they do occur to some extent on some fields here. Like this, this is a, a field just close to Yorkton where I work. And um, the producer was saying to me, I've got a field that it can produce canola, but it can't produce any wheat. And I was like, really? You know, and what was happening there is he had an area of his soil that was sulfur deficient. And when he's growing canola, he's putting sulfur down, but when he was growing, wheat, he wasn't putting any sulfur down. And so to prove the point, we've got, so, whoops, to prove the point, this is the check where I hadn't put anything. Then I just put a little bit of ammonium sulfate down here. And of course, I was putting 20 pounds of sulfur and 16.7 pounds of nitrogen come along for the ride. So to counteract that, I put some urea down here at 16.7 pounds of nitrogen. And you can kind of see that, yeah, the nitrogen has picked it up a bit, but nowhere near as well as uh, the sulfur in there. So we proved that that was um, uh, quite a sulfur deficient field. So you can run into, you know, sulfur is important for, for wheat and uh, not as much as canola, obviously, but there are, it is worthwhile putting down for that crop in certain instances. So what I'm here mostly to talk to you about is, uh, is the nitrogen. And the, the two forms of nitrogen that plants are taking up are in the ammonium form and the nitrate form. But most of what plants are taking up out there is in the nitrate form. And uh, these different forms are prone to losses. So you have volatilization where you have the ammonium form convert to ammonia and then it can gas off. So that would be a situation where you're broadcasting urea on the surface you have some heavy dews occur and then you have hot, dry, blowing wind and you could lose half of the nitrogen into the air under those, under those circumstances. Of course, once you get some rainfall and it incorporates it into the ground, then you're fine from uh, not having volatilization losses. But once it's in the soil, it gets converted to nitrate and nitrate, it's not prone to volatilization losses, but it's prone to other kinds of losses. So if you, if you have the nitrate coming down and it's late in fall and so it's been converted to nitrate and then you have waterlogged conditions in spring, the 
anaerobic bacteria are starved for oxygen and they will use the nitrate or the microbes will use the nitrate as, a, as an oxygen source and that's how you can lose the, the nitrate form. And of course, if you have light sandy soils, that nitrate form, unlike ammonium form, is mobile in the soil and so it can be leached down through the soil profile through uh, heavy, heavy rains. So to prevent these nitrogen losses, it all comes down to the four R's of nitrogen management, which include the right rate, don't put down more than you need, and right time, try and get it to when that crop needs that nitrogen as soon as, you know, when it's at the right time. Try and when it needs that nitrogen for growth, get it as close to that time as possible. Uh, the right place, preferably, you know, and generally under the ground so that it's not prone to volatilization losses. And if you have to throw it on the surface, try and use the right form. So that may mean using products like Super U, which protect against volatilization and denitrification, or Agrotain, which protects against volatilization. So when we're, we're putting nitrogen down, we have a choice of putting it down early. And if you're putting it down early with the crop, it's going towards yield. And if you put it down late, in the, in the crop growth cycle, you're really targeting protein when you're targeting that kind of timing. Now, the, the response curve to uh, added nitrogen for protein and yield is kind of interesting. If you look at the green line here, this is yield responding to added nitrogen. And at the beginning, we have really steep increases in nitrogen. And as a result, for those early applications of, or that, that low levels of increases in nitrogen can actually drive your grain protein down because your yield is going up so fast it's diluting the protein. But eventually the yield starts coming to a point of diminishing returns and levels off. And that's when protein starts coming up. And you'll note that the point at which yield levels off and the point at which protein starts to level off are different. So this creates an opportunity to try and increase grain protein, which is of interest to producers when um, they find they're in a year of low protein. And of course, you know, a lot, Mother Nature has a lot to do with what kind of protein you're going to experience. When we have years of bumper crops, protein levels are going to be low. And if we have drought and our yields are depressed, then our proteins are going to be high. Um, but sometimes I've had producers say, well, we had a, we had a fairly dry year, but we, uh, still, we still had low proteins. And what can happen is that if you have good soil moisture reserves, and uh, maybe this is more of a thing that happened around Yorkton, but we had good soil moisture reserves, little in-season precipitation, and uh, we still had very good yields. And so that dilutes the protein, but there's a, an added factor there where the soil surface is dry and that organic matter is not mineralizing because of the dryness of the soil at the surface. So normally the mineralization of the organic matter is releasing another amount of nitrogen. And so you have sort of a double whammy there. You had good yields, but you also didn't get that extra kick of nitrogen and you ended up with, with low protein. So what can you do to increase protein? Well, I suppose you could choose a different variety, but there's not a lot of wiggle room there. If you choose a variety that tends to have higher protein, it tends to be lower yielding, which uh, doesn't seem to be the best part of the trade-off. If you have the opportunity to grow in manure fields, that's great for, for protein, but not, a, not an option for everyone. And then growing after legume is obviously a good choice. Peas, it would be good, except peas, uh, uh, people have shied away from it because of phantomyces problems. Faba beans is great, but faba beans uh, is sort of a more moist area uh, where it works well, and there's limited market opportunities in there. But if growing after legume is an option for you, then that can help you with, with wheat protein. And when we, we get the question sometimes, well, what about sulfur? Because aren't there two amino acids that contain sulfur in them for protein? And yeah, that's true. But the way in which we measure protein at the grain elevator is we're actually just measuring the nitrogen in the grain. And then we're making a calculation on protein there. So based on the way that we measure uh, protein in particular, um, we haven't seen a real benefit of adding sulfur to try and improve your grain protein. This is work that Regus 
uh, did, and so this is just a bunch of different sites here, and they compare added sulfur uh, um, versus no added sulfur. And there really was no influence on protein in the way that it's measured in particular. So basically anything you do that isn't related to increasing your nitrogen rate and it increases your yield is going to decrease your protein. So that could be spraying fungicide or it could be even using a manipulator. And this is just a case in point here. We had one trial where we were using a manipulator and we got really good results with it in that particular year because the crop was going down early and it was going down hard and the manipulator really held the crop up. This was uh, Unity wheat, which doesn't have great lodging resistance. And uh, we ended up with in increasing, by using manipulator, we actually increased yield in this scenario by 10 bushels per acre, but we decreased grain protein by 1% too. So just a case in point, if you're, if you're increasing yield without using nitrogen to do it, you're gonna end up with lower protein. So what, what kinds of options are there out there to try and keep your keep your protein up as well. Well, you could look at dribble banding uh, UAN, for example, and UAN is, is a pretty good form because broadcast urea is gonna be prone to volatilization. UAN is less prone to volatilization because a quarter of it's in the nitrate form, which doesn't volatilize. And then also when it's applied in that, in that uh, dribble banded in that band, it doesn't raise the soil pH around the fertilizer like a granule of urea does. And that increase in pH causes volatilization. It drives um, it to the ammonia form. So you can look at different ways of applying the UAN. You can look at it as a dribble band application or you could look at it as a foliar spray. And in, the, in North Dakota, they actually do a lot of foliar spraying which, uh, of, of the plant post anthesis. And John Hurd from Manitoba refers to this as the 7, 10, 20, 30 rule. So the idea is to spray seven days after post anthesis. Um, you're doing 10 gallons of uh, UAN plus 10 gallons of water. So you're diluting it to try and reduce the burn effect of it. And you're trying to spray below 20 degrees Celsius because if you spray in the heat of the day, you're gonna cause more leaf burn and uh, this will apply 30 pounds of nitrogen, basically, per acre. So this approach, though, still can lead to leaf burn. And if you're out there increasing your protein as a result of burning your crop and reducing your yield, well, that's kind of counterproductive. So um, there has been a, a bunch of research that's looked at this, and you're gonna, you're gonna hear different opinions about how much nitrogen is getting into the plant through a, a foliar application out there. But you know, a lot of the research that's been done locally, you know, within Manitoba and such like stuff that Cindy Grant has done, they're finding that very little of that nitrogen that you apply as a broadcast foliar application is actually getting into the plant through the leaves. It's actually, most of it's getting washed off the leaves onto the ground, into the ground and coming up through the roots. And leaves really weren't designed to take up huge amounts of uh, macronutrients. And uh, you'll hear people saying the opposite of that out there, and I just don't believe that's the case from what most of the stuff I've seen. Like for micronutrients, yeah, foliar applications work well. Copper, if you had a copper deficiency, a foliar application can save that crop because you just need a little bit to get into the plant. But for nitrogen, you need a lot to get into the plant. Um, so there's... There are some cases, maybe the foliar would be a little more efficient if you've got dry conditions and it's not getting into the soil and maybe that little bit that's coming through the leaves may be a, a benefit. But the other thing that we wanted to explore too is looking at um, dissolved urea and it's often referred to as melted urea. And uh, it's supposed to be softer on the crop and we've actually seen that ourselves that it does seem to be softer on the foliage causing less, less leaf burn. Um, but well, I'll talk about that more in a minute here, but let's, let's sort of look at what past research has found with these late post-emergent applications of nitrogen and how well they've worked. Um, we can start with good old Ross McKenzie out of uh, Alberta agriculture. He's retired now, but in 98 to 2000, he had 26 site years. Most of them were in Alberta, but some of them were in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. 
And at, at that time, he looked at applying post-emergent applications of 15 kilograms per uh, hec hectare. Take 10% off that and you'll have pounds per acre out of that. So it's not a lot. He was only putting down 15 on a 60 kilogram base rate. So it's a lot, a lot of extra nitrogen that they were putting down late. Um, and he looked at it as ammonium nitrate form and also as a foliar UAN. Ammonium nitrate, we don't have that anymore because you make explosives out of it, but it's too bad because that was not prone to volatilization. So it was a very good late season fertilizer to apply. So he looked at applying these at the tillering stage, boot stage, and post anthesis. And based on those 26 site years, he only found like 0.3% increase in protein, and the maximum one was 1.3%. Of course, later applications did give them a little bit more protein, which makes sense because late applications go to protein more than yield. And, uh, but really in the end, they found that even though they were able to get a little bit of a protein boost, they were no better off than if they had just put all that extra nitrogen in right at seeding. So that was their, their conclusions. There was no economic benefit from the process um, at their sites. John Hurd, he got into trying to experiment with this too on the Manitoba side. He worked with uh, 15, I think it was, 15 producers. And they were different classes of wheat. So the classes of wheat that were the, the CNHR varieties, they put down a base rate of 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And the CWRS, they put down 82 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And then they did that North Dakota uh, way the broadcast foliar spray post anthesis and they put 30 pounds of nitrogen cut in half you know with with water and uh, they did get protein increases from using the practice and on average they got half a percent and this increase in protein was significant at nine out of the 15 sites and they figured if they got between eight and 15 percent leaf burn that they weren't really messing up yield or lowering yield. But they had one individual that sprayed in the heat of the day and got 31% leaf burn. They figured he lost six bushels per acre as a result of the process. So when he did all the economics, there were only two sites out of 15 that proved to be economical from, from doing this practice. And uh, one of them was because they got a big, they had a large bushel increase and a 1% protein increase, and one site got 1.5% protein increase. So not a lot of you know, positive experience there, really. So now we're, we'll move on to what we've done with agri-arm sites. And the agri-arm sites are um, scattered all throughout uh, Saskatchewan. There's eight of us, um, and these are the different locations. Um, and in our first year, what we did was we looked at uh, just UAN without looking at the dissolved urea aspect. And so my first two, one, first two graphs here, like the, these bars represent yield. The blue bars are yield and the orange dots up there are protein. And when we increased side banded urea from 70 pounds of nitrogen to 100 pounds of nitrogen, we increased yield somewhat there and we also increased protein. And then we looked at applying 30 pounds of nitrogen, you know, in different ways, post-emergent, to a base rate of 70. So we looked at dribble banding it at pre-boot, we looked at dribble banding it post-anthesis, and then we also looked at it as a broadcast foliar spray post-anthesis. And we did increase protein. But you'll, you'll note here that these increases in protein from here to here are no better than if we had just put all the nitrogen down at seeding. So in the end, even though we could increase protein, it wasn't better than putting it down at seeding, so it really wasn't a economical practice. So we got very similar results to what Ross McKenzie got uh, years ago. But if you have over 1% biuret in the urea you're dissolving, you will burn your crop more so because biuret is a byproduct of the urea process. But in North America, I understand most of our sources do not have biurets above that 1% level. But if you're going to try it, make sure you check with your supplier that the biuret is not high in the urea. 
The other thing about it is that the process is endothermic, so it's going to make things cold. So if you're taking well water that's really cold out of the ground and, and uh, using that as a water so source, you may freeze some lines in the process of trying to uh, dissolve the urea, urea. Now, we had no problems at all, but we had a tank of water that's sitting on the surface, and by this late time in summer, the water's quite warm, so we had no problems dissolving uh, urea, any problems in it. But Amy, when she, she did it out of Manitoba, she compared UAN to melted urea, but she really wasn't comparing apples to apples. She had 14% UAN, 14% nitrogen with the UAN, and was comparing it to 9%. It was the same amount of nitrogen going down per acre, it's just that one was more concentrated than, than the other. But she certainly found uh, the, the urea, dissolved urea, was causing a lot less leaf burn compared to the UAN. And she was also finding a yield bump from using dissolved urea and a protein bump to it. So we thought we'd give it a try and, and see what kind of results we could get with, with it. So again, we conducted this over all eight agriarm locations in this case. And here's the data that's averaged over all the locations. So the blue bars again are the yield, orange is the protein. As I increased the side band of urea from 70 to 100, we got a little bit of a, a yield increase and a little bit of a protein increase in, in that year. When we used uh, dribble banded UAN at the boot stage, we got more of a protein increase. And when we used dribble banded UAN post anthesis, we got more of a protein, quite a bit more of a protein increase. And for some reason, if we used diluted UAN, uh, so it was only 14% nitrogen, we got not as much of a protein increase. And I'm not sure why that occurred, um, but it happened whether we did it post anthesis or if we did it at the boot stage. And I'm not sure why that occurred because in both cases, we're still applying 30 pounds of nitrogen to a base rate of 70 pounds of nitrogen. It's just that one is more concentrated than the other. When we were doing foliar applications, uh, we got a very good protein boost on average. Um, whether we were using UAN or dissolved urea, and um, we didn't get quite as good of a protein boost if we were dribble banding it instead of a foliar application. Now, we we definitely saw there was less leaf injury, and in our experiment, we were comparing apples to apples. Both of them are 14% nitrogen. So you're looking at UAN, 14% nitrogen, and dissolved urea at 14% nitrogen. And you can see here that we've got more leaf burn here at Yorkton compared to the, the dissolved urea. And that was quite a common occurrence at all, all the locations. So it does seem to be softer on the crop, at least. Um, so we did, you'll, you'll note, if you make these comparisons, we did have a lot of cases where the proteins were higher by doing a split application of nitrogen compared to just putting all the nitrogen down at seeding. So that's a little bit different than the year before. You know, The year before, we didn't get a benefit protein-wise from the split applications. In this case, we did. But in a lot of cases, we also ended up lowering yield somewhat from these higher protein situations. So how did things turn out economically in the end? In this slide, these these are the gross returns for the treatments plus any protein relative protein premium that was based on a fairly wide spread of 66 cents per percent per bushel minus the cost of nitrogen because the nitrogen did differ between say 70 and 100 for example and then minus the cost of having to go out there for with another application of uh, the split application nitrogen and I took that to be five dollars an acre for sake of argument so all of these are fair economic comparisons between the, between the treatments. And really what you're trying to beat is this one here, where we've put all the nitrogen down um, at seeding. And so this is the one to beat. And there were maybe two, arguably, that could give a little bit higher economic returns. But boy, the difference here, even at four extra bucks an acre, seems hardly worth the, the extra effort of having gone out there a second time. 
So there wasn't a lot of economic reason. Even though we were able to increase protein in a lot of cases, it still didn't seem very economical to go out and do this process. So how did this vary between sites? Well, here's Indian head, and none of the treatments were better than just putting all the nitrogen down at seeding. Even at this far end, where we got a really big protein boost from applying broadcast foliar applications, whether they were UAN or urea, we still didn't make, a, make it economically. And if you go to their data, you can see why. So here's our big protein boost here. But you know, look at these yields here compared to putting all the nitrogen down at seeding. So we lost out on seed, lost out on yield. We may have burnt the crop from doing the process. And like I said before, if you're getting higher proteins by burning the crop, it's kind of counterproductive. Uh, Melfort, none of the treatments were more economical. Scott, none of the, the split applications. And at Yorkton, none was really more economical. There were some more economical uh, situations at Outlook. Outlook had sort of a weird situation where um, when we were dribble banding uh, the UAN post anthesis, if you look at their data for this, you can see that they got a real sharp protein increase there. Um, but that certainly wasn't the case at every location where that, where that kind of thing occurred. At uh, Prince Albert, they had some that were more economical, but for some reason with their situation, they, they had higher yields associated with many of their split applications. Um, and I would also say that, you know, this difference here in yield response is pretty minimal, so that was a little questionable. This Redverse had some odd data in here. Basically, they had, uh, they had, I believe it was lower yield on this one, which doesn't make any sense. So a fair comparison might have been with the 70N. So if you make a comparison with the 70N, um, there were little situations where it was economically viable. And similarly, okay, so swift current had a drop in protein, which again doesn't make much sense when you're increasing the nitrogen rate here. And so I think a fair comparison is probably with the 70N. And when you do that, there weren't a lot of cases where uh, it was economical to split application. So my, my conclusion is basically in 2018, the split application of nitrogen really wasn't ec economical. Um, it was better just to put all the nitrogen down at seeding. We sort of got uh, the same sort of uh, um, conclusion for 2019. Um, we, we did reduce leaf berm with using uh, melted urea, but despite that, we still didn't prove any sort of economical situations from having used, used the melted urea over UAN. So uh, to me, this split application um, strategy is not something you should plan to do. But if you have a situation where you know, you, you know you've under-fertilized the crop uh, for the kind of conditions you have that year, you, have a really, you think you've got a really big bumper crop coming, and um, there might be some value to trying to do a split application to raise that protein, particularly if you think you're going to have protein levels that are so low that uh, you know, the green elevators may not be that interested in it. Maybe it'll pay in that situation. But for the vast majority of cases, from what I've seen and over the history and stuff, this practice doesn't seem to, to be an economical practice most of the time. So in another, another nitrogen study that I just want to end with um, came about from our board of directors that were talking about um, broadcasting uh, uh, urea onto snow. And they said there's a lot of guys in our area doing that, and really is that a, a, a a smart thing to do, because isn't that practice, for example, banned in Manitoba? Aren't we just you know, putting ourselves up for losing uh, more nitrogen? And you know, I, I realize the, the pressure to do so, to be more efficient, and you, you're just going to have to weigh those, those uh, situations out to see um, what's the most beneficial way to, to do that. Obviously, when you put your nitrogen down in the fall before seeding is going to go that much faster in, in spring. So what we looked at 
is that we looked at applications that were early fall. So we're looking at broadcast urea and super U. And remember, super U is protecting us against volatilization losses into the air and also denitrification losses by waterlogged conditions. So we put it on too early, in early fall, like October 2nd. Uh, this is in Yorkton. And uh, the reason that's too early is it's on warm soil and that urea gets all kinds of time to convert to nitrate. And once it's in the nitrate form, then it's prone to being lost in waterlogged soils. And then we put it on in late fall, on October 27th, and that's the right time for that area to be putting it down. Um, the soils are cold, so it's not a lot of time to be converted into nitrate. And then we put it on late. We put it on 10 centimeters of snow. And this was November 5th at that time. And we compared this to a late fall banded application of urea, and that's kind of my poor man's anhydrous ammonia comparison. But the real good check is side banding at seeding. And side banding at seeding is the right time and place. And we're getting the best use of nitrogen for, for that scenario. So in this night, and when I show you the chart, just remember that every one of those treatments in the chart has received the same amount of nitrogen. It's just been put down in a different way. This is what the snow looked like at the time when I was applying it, how deep it was. So it's not super deep. And then here's the results. Again, blue bars yield orange protein. That green bar now on the far right is the check to beat. That's all the nitrogen side banded at seeding. That's the best scenario. And you can see here that is giving us the best yield and the best grain protein by putting the nitrogen down at the right time and place. That far green bar now on the right, that is putting nitrogen down too early in fall. So it's got all kinds of time to convert to nitrate. And you can see we've really reduced our yield quite a bit from the check over here. We've lost 20 bushels of yield and we've lost a couple or a, a percent and a half of protein. Now, if we used Super U, which is the next one over, you can see we've improved our yield and protein. So we protected that, that nitrogen from some losses, but we're still not better than if we had just put it all down in spring the following year. If we now broadcast the urea at the right time, you can see we've improved our yields. We've, we're not losing so much to probably denitrification in this case by putting it on later in the year when the soil is cold. And when we used Super U, we did improve the protein yield situation, but not as much as when we put it all on too early. There's the, there's the late fall. Uh, banded urea, so there's going to be no volatilization losses to that because we've put it into the ground, but we're still not better than the spring. So this yield difference in here is sort of a reflection, and protein difference is a reflection of what we lost to denitrification in wet soils the following spring. And now, now we're broadcasting on snow, and it's not a good treatment at all. It's quite low. It's, it's just as bad as when we put, put the fertilizer down too early. So, you know, when uh, the other thing to note here is when we use Super U broadcast it on snow, it didn't do us any favors at this time as conditions were just too rough for volatilization. And what happens is that the ground's frozen, you get wet snow melt on frozen ground and, you know, the urea is just prone to volatilization losses and it, it really wasn't a good scenario, basically. So how did it work out economically? Well, I used a wide protein spread, but I also used a really wide um, price differential between urea and super U, which I've been criticized for doing. But that is what the elevator quoted me at the time. So I used the value and I'll keep it here. But they tell me that normally the difference between super U and, and uh, urea should be more like $135 per ton difference. So. For our particular experiment, the Super U did pay for itself, and it would have paid for itself even more if it was a more typical um, spread in tons. So again, the most economic treatment by far is, is side banding in spring. And here's, here's the gross returns here. And uh, 
using the Super U, increased our gross returns when the product was applied really early in fall. And it did a little bit too when it was applied at the ideal time. But it didn't do us any favors at all when we applied to the snow. So yeah, the conclusions are the right time, right place, and, right, and, and the right combination. I hear is the new fifth for, the fifth for R is now the right combination of all these things, just to make things more complicated. So here's our, here's our website. Um, you can visit our website and we've got like about 40 videos on, you know, little short videos that cover the results from some of our trials in there. And that's my number that you can text if you want to be on our email list and be notified when we've posted a new video or such.